welcome to the Virtual Business Lifestyle Podcast, where being a mobile entrepreneur, utilizing outsourcing, and creating passive income leads you to a lifestyle you'll love to be living. Let's get going. Hey everybody, Chris Ducker here and welcome to another edition of the Virtual Business Lifestyle Podcast. I got a real doozy for you today. Thanks very much uh, for doozy. joining and my uh, special guest, uh, best-selling author. Uh, if you haven't come across any of his books, I don't know where you've been living for the last three or four years. Uh, but um, David Merman Scott, author of New Rules of Marketing and PR. That's what you're most famous for. Come on down. How are you doing, buddy? Uh, I'm great, Chris. Good to be here. Thanks a lot for uh, doing this. We're on different time zones, but it works out fine. We are. You're in Boston. I'm wearing a green shirt, so that automatically gets me <laughs> brownie points. Am I right? Uh, absolutely. Hey, we got all sorts of Celtics things going on here with we the do. green. Although uh, it's Red Sox season now, Boston Red Sox baseball. It is. I and, caught a game um, when I was there. Are, I caught a game at Fenway are, Park. It was cold when I watched oh, that game. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. You, were here, you were here in the cold weather. I was at the park on Friday. The big rivalry, the Red Sox versus the Yankees, um, always good fun. That'll be it. That'll be the one. Well, listen, I brought you on the show here. Um, you know, virtual business lifestyle is all about one or two things. It's about breaking free of that nine to five grind and setting up your own business, or it's about taking your own business to the next level. Um, I came across you for the first time when I picked up a copy of Worldwide Rave, right? Uh, which mm-hmm. I thought was a fantastic book. And um, it was all about fundamentally creating an ebook, getting it out there, sharing it with the world, trying to create yep. that rave, which I did. Yep. I now have three or four ebooks Excellent. Uh, Good that for I've you. given away. And um, you probably won't remember, but uh, what was it, a couple of three years ago now, I think it was. And you were very nice to go ahead and tweet out a link to my first free ebook after I emailed Excellent. you about it. So what was the title? Remind me what the was title called, was. It was called Outsourcing, uh, sorry, it was called <coughs> business, business Growth and the Outsourcing Lifestyle. And it I had, remember that. You sure. do? It had a big green yeah. cover with a golf course and a dollar sign. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't tweet everything I'm sent. I only tweet the good ones. <laughs> there you go. That's what I'm talking about. Only people from Boston do that. I just want to clarify <laughs> that for everybody on the line. Well, you know, I, um, I worked for um, about 15 years for big companies. Uh, I worked uh, in New York City. I worked in Tokyo. I worked in Hong Kong. And I worked in Boston. And... Um, you know, it was fine at the time, but uh, I got sacked three different times. <laughs> I got sacked um, once in New York, I ended up finding another job in New York. I moved to Asia, I got sacked when I was living in Hong Kong, ended up moving back to the States where I'm from, uh, and I got sacked here in Boston. And I was like, God damn it, there's got to be a better way. So nine years ago, I started my own thing, and I, I, I'd been running my own business. A lot of it's virtual because... Um, Although I do have an office, which I'm sitting in right now, that's outside of my home, just because I like I like to get the work, the separation of mm-hmm. home life and and work life. So I have a little office in the town that I live in, but I probably spend over a hundred days a year on the road, um, uh, traveling all over the world, giving speeches, and uh, so I'm I'm living that virtual, independent. Um, survive by your own wits lifestyle that um, obviously you know and love. <laughs> I sure do. And, you know, the guys that tune in uh, at Virtual Business Lifestyle, both, both via the blog and, and iTunes as well, um, <clears throat> have become more and more accustomed uh, hearing from authors and speakers and that, that type of guest here on the show over the last year or so. We've had some great, great guys uh, on on board. Chris Brogan, Jonathan Fields, yeah. you know, the, yeah. the list is endless. And adding someone like yourself to that uh, vintage collection of um, <laughs> of marketing greats is fantastic. Now, I, 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 like I said, I came across you initially with World Wide Rave, but right. then um, I went out and picked up New Rules, uh, which – immediately became my Bible uh, in in the way that I looked at uh, marketing my business online. My business has been Mm -hmm. um, up and running now close to four and a half years, and Mm -hmm. we have become very successful. We've grown from seven employees to almost 300 now. Wow, uh, good for you. In that time. Yeah, it's been a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, uh, but it's also been a lot of uh, fun and games as well. And one of the things that I really appreciated about those first two books 
um, that I that I've read of yours, and I've also read all of your free eBooks and things like that mm -hmm. as well. And and for everyone listening in or watching on the blog, you should certainly get over to uh, David's site. We'll, we'll link everything below um, the uh, you know the video here on the blog. But if you're listening in on iTunes, it's davidmermanscott.com. Uh, everything links for everything on there, blog, books, the whole lot. And what I really took away from those first two books of yours that I had read is that you can't duplicate. You've got to innovate. You've got to get out yes. there and do your own thing. And that yes. was really the first thing I wanted to kind of touch base with you on. Um, and, 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 you know, it's tough. You know, when you're starting a business to begin with, it's, it's tough to try and be innovative because mm – -hmm you want to kind of almost model yourself on what other successful people, particularly those within your niche or niche as, as friends on the other side of the pond say, uh, <laughs> you know, it, it's tough because you want to model yourself like that. What, what advice do you think you could give to the, to the first time entrepreneur, someone that has escaped that nine to five grind and is just yeah. starting setting up their businesses in regards to the marketing aspect? Yeah. So, um, well, first of all, just, just what, what, struck me as you were asking a question around how to model your business is I do think you're right. I think people tend to model their business on another business that's virtually identical to the business that they want to start or that they're trying to grow, which I think is a, is a big mistake. So I look at myself. Um, I write books. I give speeches. I create a whole bunch of free content on the web that I, that I give away to help um, get people exposed to what I do. But I don't model myself on anybody else who's done that. Believe it or not, what I model myself after are, are rock bands, musicians, bands that have done a really interesting job getting themselves out there. And so I think the same thing is true of any business. Not that you should model yourself up after a rock band, although that's perfectly fine, <laughs> but model yourself after a business that you um, that you respect and then you do business with and that you understand. Um, could be anything. Could be a restaurant. Could be a car dealer. Could be um, Apple computer. Whatever it is. But what is it that you like about them? What is it that draws you to them? What is it that you think is interesting? Why do you do business with them? So I'm a huge rock music fan. I've seen, um, I've literally, I'm so nerdy. I have a, a database of uh, 436 bands I've seen live in concert. I add to it every time I go to a show. I've seen some great, great shows. And so thinking about how a rock band is successful, what do they do? They tour. That's what I do because I do book, you know, I tour and uh, give speeches all over the world. Yep. They create albums. And I do that too in the form of books. I create books and, and get them out there. I work with publishers. The rock bands work with labels. I also sometimes create free um, ebooks. Just like rock bands create free tunes on, give them away on free downloads. Um, I have lots of content on YouTube. Great rock bands have lots of content on YouTube. Um, I write a blog. I, I have, I'm on Twitter. Good rock bands have presence like that as well. So literally that's what I've done. I've modeled myself to the point that I, one of the books that I wrote that came out a couple of years ago, actually last year, it's called Marketing Lessons from the Grateful Dead. <laughs> I saw that. I saw that. And, and, and what did you do? Did you, got, did you actually go on tour with the guys? Because you came pretty tight with them. You, you, you were yeah, kind of close to we, them at the end of it all, we right? Have, um, we, we have become – I have a co-author on that book. His name is Brian Halligan. He's the CEO of a company called HubSpot. So um, Brian and I did not know any of the band members when we started – but since that time, we've gotten reasonably close to some of the band members. Um, in fact, two weeks ago, I sat down with one of them, did a YouTube interview with the Mickey Hart, who's one of the percussionists. Um, and we've become part of the Grateful Dead community, which is, uh, which is really, really, really interesting. But I realized that because I spent so much time thinking about how my business, again, an author, a speaker, is similar to a rock band, and literally modeling my business after what I think a successful rock man, band does, that I say, well, shoot, my, maybe I should write a book about this subject. Right. But, um, but I, I, I do think that would be my, my best advice, is, is think of a business that's totally unlike yours on the surface. A rock band and, and an author, you know, how different can they be? Yeah. But when, when you peel away the layers, you're actually 
identical in many ways. So then you take the best ideas of the successful people that you admire and apply those. And when you do that, what's remarkable is that you're not doing what your competitors are doing. Because people who do what I do aren't taking a leaf out of the page book of a, of a rock band. They're, they're thinking about what other authors are doing and copying them. So it's kind of interesting. It's very right. I, you, you, you're bang on because also I, have, I haven't had the pleasure of seeing you speak live before, but I have many other authors, obviously, from conventions and expos and things yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, we've, we've been ships in the night. What more can I say so far? Yeah, right. we'll, we'll make it happen. We'll make it happen. But um, the one thing, obviously, I have, I've looked at a lot of the videos that you have on YouTube and on your blog and stuff like that as well. And the one thing that I do notice is that you go down into your audience mm -hmm. a lot more regularly than a lot of the yeah. other speakers that I see. Yeah. You physically, in fact, yeah. I've actually seen you jump off one of the stages in one of the clips where <laughs> you know your hair, your hair went again. everywhere, and you were like this after <laughs> and everything. You know. So, yeah, yeah. what what what's your what is your um, what's your deal with that? Why do you do that? I'm, I'm curious to know. Well, I I think of what I do is not giving a speech. I think of it as giving a performance. You know, if somebody's in a, in a hotel ballroom for an hour and they come to devote a full hour of their day to hear me speak, it's not about delivering information. That's only one third of it. I look at it as one third delivering information, right. one third providing motivation to act, and one third entertaining people so that they, they, they wish it would go on rather than, um, you know, hope it would end. <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, right. And we've all been and, in those kind of speeches or, or sessions before, right? Oh, God, all the time. <laughs> and, I, and, and, you know, I'm, I'm coming back to the theme we just touched on. I have been to 436 rock, live rock shows, and I know what works in a live rock show. And if the band is going through the motions, it doesn't work. If the band is really into it, it works. If they're sweating, if they're getting down and dirty, if they're, if they're mixing it up and improvising, if they're not doing idiotic things like, um, like, like lip syncing and whatnot, that believe it or not, some, some bands are still doing. Um, and then sometimes if they even you know, jump off the stage and go into the audience, people remember that. It's yeah. a, an exciting part of the show. And I'm not a rock musician. I don't have any musical ability. I wish I could. It'd be really exciting. But I have the next best thing. And, um, and what's interesting about that going into the audience thing is it's a, it's a way that people learn and remember. Is there's a, there's a huge demarcation between a stage and an audience. There's a barrier. It's, it's a huge, huge barrier between a stage and an audience. As soon as you break the barrier by going into the audience, people feel closer to the speaker than if that barrier has not been broken. And, and what's interesting about that, I've studied this, I've, I've, I've learned from some experts who've, who've studied it really, I mean professionally studied communication skills around uh, proximity. You know, you've got the proximity of the stage is right. like 20 feet or more. But once you get into the sort of five feet or less, it's, it's called personal space. When you get into somebody's personal space, they remember you much, much more than if you haven't been in their personal space. And the other thing that's remarkable about that is that if you get into somebody's personal space in an audience, the entire audience projects as if you were having, if, as if you were in their personal space. Mm. So a rock band in front of uh, 10,000 people in an arena, if the lead singer gets off the stage and goes into the front rows and, and is, in, is in, the, in the audience, even the people in the very back row, row will project as if the singer were in five feet in front of them even though they're, they're hundreds of feet away. Right. Same, thing in, in, same thing in my case in a hotel ballroom. There's five, 500 people in the room. Um, I, I go in the front row, maybe work an aisle or two. I can't be within five feet of everyone in the audience, um, but everyone in the audience will have thought unconsciously that I was actually speaking directly to them right. as if I were five feet away. 
And that's what I learned from rock bands. And uh, again, you know, this theme is, is that you can learn from a business very much unlike yourself. You know, um, I've done some work for the United States military, and I think they can learn from uh, co companies. I think that for-profit companies can learn from nonprofits. Um, I think that everybody can learn from politicians, the good and the bad. Um, so really interesting ways to get an advantage over your marketplace that is completely the opposite of copying the competition. Amen to that. Amen to that. Absolutely. Now you bring up politicians here, and I and and I <laughs> I, I was I was hoping you were going to do it because I remember seeing something a while back on your blog in regards to Twitter town hall with uh, President mm -hmm. Obama, where you had you'd been one of the uh, you know one of the people that had submitted a question to him via Twitter for him yeah. to ask. I, I I believe it was in regards to jobs. I can't remember yep. the exact tweet. That's exactly right. Okay. And um, I also remember that, uh, and and the, the video clip itself, you you would actually embedded into a uh, into a post, and you were talking about that. Yep. You know, you got in early. You were the first. Yep. You know, in one of the first couple of hundred or whatever it was to go ahead and get that question through. Um, right. And that one question, everybody then started checking out. It raised you. I remember it raised your clout score, which I thought was yeah, quite yeah, yeah. cool. Yeah, like you mentioned that. Or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What what um, you know? What did it feel like to one minute be sending a tweet and the next minute, you know, hear President Obama answering it live on TV? Oh, it was um, it was incredibly thrilling um, to me. I I'm a, a a big fan of presidential politics. I think it's fascinating from a communications and marketing perspective. Mm -hmm. um, we're in the early stages of the 2012 presidential election. Um, uh, campaign season. Uh, it'll go until November of 2012. And, and I'm already like every day I watch something on television and check out the newspapers and right. read, read about it online. I'm a big fan of it. So um, what happened was on July 2nd, uh, the White House announced that there is going to be a Twitter town hall on July 6th. And so um, I, as soon as I saw the announcement, I knew in my gut that I had to ask my question right away. Um, basically, the way this thing works is that anybody could send a tweet with a question to President Obama, and they use the hashtag uh, Ask Obama. So hashtag Ask Obama. And then um, the questions were curated by both technology and also by humans, and they came up with 18 questions to ask the president live uh, in the White House on national and international television and streaming on the web on July 6th. So I knew that, that the only way I was going to get attention is if I did it early enough that I was one of the very few people on that first day. And they were only, believe it or not, only a couple of hundred people asked questions the first day. It was remarkable to me that there was that few people. Mm. Yet the last day, July 6th, there were over 20,000 questions submitted. Right. In all, by that time, the chances are that they had probably picked those 18 questions already, right? Yeah, or maybe they'll pick one out that came out that right. day. But what's your chances when it's 1 in 20,000 oh, yeah. versus your chances if it's 1 in 200? Right, right. Um, and, of course, you know, some, some cynic said because I have 56,000 followers on Twitter and a decent clout score, that's one of the reasons why I was chosen. And, sure, that might have been one of the reasons but they didn't choose any question from Mashable. They didn't choose any question from the Huffington Post. They have much, much, much better numbers than I do. Right. They chose my question. Right. So my takeaway with that from that is, and this is a theme of what I've been writing about for, and researching for the last couple of years, is that uh, being first has a definite um, uh, clout. Uh, being first allows you to do lots of different things from a marketing communications perspective. I didn't think my question was going to be answered. And um, I actually was on vacation when the Twitter town hall was going on. And um, I was hanging out with my family on a beach. And my daughter's cell phone goes off. And she answers it. Hello. And 
and she she kind of like has this quizzical look on her face, and she says, "Hey, Daddy, did you send? Did you ask President Obama a question? <laughs> did you send him a tweet? And I, <laughs> Does he and follow said, you on Twitter? You know, <laughs> yeah, right, right." <laughs> and I said, and I said, yeah. And she goes, well, my friend Nick, who's a um, who's working on on uh, in Washington D.C. for the summer, just said that he answered your question on television. And I'm like, whoa, that's cool. And I didn't I didn't have my computer on. I didn't have my mobile phone. Nothing was on. I was just right. you know hanging out with my family on right. the beach. And so then um, I have some stuff with me. I, I checked it. I'm like, damn right, he did answer my question. How cool is that? Um, so, um, yeah, it was, and then I was able to, to go back and look at the, uh, the video of it and, 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 and post a little snippet of that Q and a, but I mean, how cool is it that anybody can ask a question that can theoretically get answered by um, the president of the United States through social networks I think there's a lot to be learned there. And I, I don't think because I've got you know a reasonable number of followers or anything like that. Right. I mean, might have might have been a little bit of it, but right. there were people who had only a hundred followers who had their questions answered. I you know, think it was because I asked it first. I, I I think you're right. I think it's because you got in there very quickly, and because yeah. of that, they could sort of maybe maybe at that point they were very very possibly sifting through those questions with a lot more kind I of think vigorous attitude about the whole thing and all the rest of it as oh, well. I think there were. <clears throat> I think there were. There were I think I I think I recall there were eight people who they had as on the committee of people who were um checking for the questions and right. choosing the ones to ask. Right. And um so, you know, imagine you're one of the committee. That's a big responsibility. It's your job to look through all these tweets and choose the eighteen to ask the president. And so you want to get a head start on that. Why not take a look at the questions that appeared on July 2nd? Oh, geez, this one looks pretty good. Let's put that in the maybe category. Right. And then it stayed there in the maybe category for four days. And then it right. was asked. There you go. And the rest is political history, as they say. Well, you know, you know <laughs> as a fan of presidential politics, it is kind of cool to have It is. President. But I mean, President Obama <laughs> as he... Is you know he's always he's, he's he's the cool president he's the cool guy he's walking around with the iPad and the dodo case and he's you know <laughs> he's doing all these you know tweets and he's cool and all the rest of it so you know I I you know I think it's a great way to be able to um, expand expand your reach uh, and you know pretty much everyone's on Twitter nowadays that really is worth anything in any way shape or form so I I, I, th I think you know <laughs> don't I, tell I, that to my parents right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I won't. I won't do that. But no, I mean, I, I thought it was pretty cool when I saw that clip, and I'm sure that you thought it was way cooler yourself. Now, that goes oh, yeah. on to the section of this call where I want to focus on real-time marketing and PR, which is right. your right. latest, greatest book, yes. as they say. Um, yes. Very much a follow-up to the very successful uh, New Rules of Marketing and PR, which I believe now is in its second edition. Am I right? um, actually, it is in its sec it, you're, you're right, it's in its second currently, but in two weeks, the third edition comes wow. out. So how many copies and, are you uh, looking at that thing now? How many copies have you sold of that now? A quarter million copies. Wow. In, in 30 different languages. That's um, yeah, it's pretty, it's, pretty, it's pretty remarkable. Congratulations, I mean, I, that's fantastic. I'm kind of, thank you, thank you. I'm kind of amazed myself, to be honest with you. Um, I, I, uh, you seem yes, to be taking yesterday. it very much in your stride. I've got to be honest. <laughs> well, it's 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 really cool. Um, yeah. It's really cool. Yesterday, I got um, some copies in Italian. That they, I mean, the, the publishers send me when a new edition in a new language comes out. They send me the copies, and I get three or four or five copies of the book. And it's just it's just so cool. I've got a whole shelf of books. Um, that uh, are, are all of the different translations in the different countries, and all of the uh, the different um, covers are all a little bit different, you know, in the different languages. Fantastic. That's cool. Uh, but yeah, so the third edition came, comes out, and then in November of 2010, so a um, little bit less than a year ago, I put out this book called Real Time Marketing and PR. The concept there is, and, and again, this this is following on to something we talked about earlier that I like to look at other industries to get ideas. So in the marketing area, um, one of the ideas I drew on is the financial markets. And I worked on Wall Street for the first couple of years of my career 
uh, in New York City. I actually worked in the World Trade Center um, for a company called Dean Winter Reynolds. And I was on a bond trading desk. And bond trading is all about instant, real time, right. right now. If you don't make a trade when there's an opportunity, a second later, the opportunity is gone. And it's all about managing your your financial resources, in the case of a bond trader, a bond portfolio, instantly. And I saw some parallels with the rise of the web for marketers. The, the web and things like Twitter and YouTube and, and blogs and, and all of these, these tools, they're all real time. If somebody changes their status update on Facebook, their friends see it instantly. Somebody tweets something about a company, it's out there instantly. If someone does a YouTube video, there it is. Yet what I was noticing was every single company I spoke with was not engaged in real-time marketing and real-time public relations. Instead, they were basing their marketing and PR on a campaign mentality. Right. They were planning for the future. Now, there's nothing wrong with planning for the future. I do that, too. There's nothing wrong with right. that. Right. But right. what's but what's wrong, dead wrong, is only planning for the future. What I mean by that is these big companies and little companies would spend all of their time, 100% of their time, planning for, say, a product launch that's going to happen in six months, a press release that they're going to put out two weeks from now, um, an advertising campaign that's going to kick off next week. And they were letting go by opportunities that would appear on Twitter, that would appear on blogs, that would appear in the news. And, you know, we just talked about a great example, the opportunity of being able to ask the President of the United States a question. That's an opportunity. I reacted like a bond trader would. I reacted instantly. My question was answered. People who planned for creating an answer and did it three days later or four days later their questions were not almost none of those were answered on a percentage basis. So getting in PR is about is looking for opportunities and responding to threats immediately as they're happening right now, this instant. And um, there's just so few companies that are doing that, but the opportunity is huge. Now, I remember seeing something very recently where you talked about one thing, and, and forgive me, um, you're much more of a rock fan than myself. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm more of, I, I'm more of a, a blues and jazz guy myself. But, That's um, all right. Yeah, it's, it, it's, it cl a little bit of blues can class as rock, right, every now and then, right? Oh, yeah, yeah I know. And, and, it's all, and, and Grateful Dead, for example, is everything, blues, rock, jazz, right. all put together. Indeed it is. So... I remember seeing a, a clip where you were talking about one particular musician who had his um, guitar broken. Ah, uh, yes. And you had spoken, you had broken it down, and you had charts and all this sort of type of thing and everything in your, in your, in your talk where, you know, he had tried over and over and over again for the best part of a year to get compensated for this broken guitar, right. and nothing yep. happened. In Nothing a happened. sort of yeah, in in sort of a two to three minute nutshell, can you tell that story again? Because the yeah the the, the time span involved and how things quickly unfolded after he went quote unquote public on social media. Right. I think it was a YouTube video. Am I right? Yeah. So it was Dave Carroll is the name of the musician. Right. And he he tried uh, uh, United United Airlines broke his guitar. He spent a year trying to get compensation. Finally, United refused definitively so he did three YouTube videos the first one was released called United Breaks Guitars and it went um, it went crazy basically there were um, a million views by the third day and United Airlines chose not to comment so their real-time decision was to not engage the market when at least for their business a crisis was occurring right. when when the entire planet is looking at a video about how you break guitars and you don't respond, I mean, that's just ridiculous. Yeah. You know, they had a policy of no comment, which is not the right policy. Right. Um, no comment is not smart. No comment is a very dumb thing to do. Uh, unless there's a legal reason, for example, you're under a, you're under a lawsuit and you're not allowed to talk. Any other reason, just uh, no comment is not the right move. Right. Um, but then, 
And so that's what happened to United Airlines. Meanwhile, Dave Carroll is becoming famous because his video is flashing around the world. I think it's up, it's up to over 10 million views now. That's unbelievable. Um, but then but what was uh, it? He, he went or... to bed and there was like, or, and he woke up the next morning, there was like 500. Then there was a lunch. Yeah, was like, yeah. You know... it grew fairly slowly the first day couple hundred, then I think it was 25,000 and a quarter million, you know, that wow. sort of exponential growth. Right. But um, what, um, what was interesting is that two organizations took advantage in real time of the opportunity. One was Taylor Guitars. The brand of guitar that was broken was a Taylor guitar. And in fact, in the song, Dave Carroll actually said it was a Taylor guitar that got broken. So Bob Taylor, the CEO of Taylor Guitar, literally that day created his own YouTube video where he talked about how to protect your guitar and how to travel safely with a guitar on an airplane. And that video has gotten a half million views. He had a real-time opportunity and he took advantage of it. United Airlines had a real-time opportunity to set the record straight. They did not take advantage of it. Another organization that did is a company called Kelton Cases. They're a manufacturer of guitar cases. Uh, they created the Dave Carroll Signature Edition guitar case, um, and they also took advantage of the opportunities. So that's the idea of real-time. And, and, you know, when I tell a story like that, a lot of people like you in the B2B world would say, well, I don't know, that doesn't really, you know, that's a consumer example, you know. So I'd like to tell another story about a B2B example. Um, a company called Eloqua um, actually did a real-time blog post that generated over a million dollars worth of business for them. Here's what happened. Joe Payne, the CEO of Eloqua, um, found out um, that one of his biggest competitors had just been acquired by Oracle big software company. Eloqua is in the marketing automation software space. So what Eloqua does is, um, what Joe Payne does is he says, you know what, I can do a real-time um, a blog post about this. And he did. He created a blog post, put it out about two or three hours after the um, Oracle announcement, and he um, provided context to the Oracle announcement about the acquisition of his competitor. He didn't try to, to um, say anything negative about the competitor. All he did was say, hey, here's what it means for the industry. Here's what it means for the marketing automation business. And then um, um, about 10 or 15 different blogs and media outlets, um, PC World, Information World, for example, Business Week, for example, included Joe Payne's blog post quotes in the articles that they wrote about the acquisition that appeared the next day, then, uh, very clever, um, what Joe did was he had his company send a, um, an email to everybody in their database marked as a customer of Market to Lead and shared the link to the blog post he wrote. And that generated a whole bunch of people who wanted to engage with them. They were scared about doing business with Oracle. They wanted to do business with Eloqua. And they sold um, their first deal. This is enterprise-level software. Their first deal was with Red Hat uh, Software, a quarter of a million-dollar deal uh, over two years, half a million-dollar contract. And they've done a million dollars worth of business. A million dollars worth of business on one blog post that probably took an hour to write. Right. The only reason it was successful was because he wrote it instantly. Right. Had he waited even 10 hours or 12 hours, it would not have been successful. Right, right. And it wouldn't have been, like you said, quoted in all those other outlets and all the rest of it as well. No. Because it wouldn't have, it wouldn't looking, have been new. They, they, yeah, it wouldn't have been new. They were looking to write their stories, and they wanted to quote somebody other than the acquiring company. Right. And what, what, what's better than the CEO of a competitor? Absolutely. This is, is a brilliant move. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Genius. Genius move. Okay. So, I mean... So, it works for B2B and it works for B2C. It sure does, obviously. And, I mean, you're, you're obviously a big social media fan. That's a given, right? We, we can kind of get that already. Um, <laughs> and, I mean, if you're, if you're just... As well as, obviously, being on top of trends that are happening within your, you know, industry and things like that, um, what do you... I mean, what do you... How do you feel about sort of 
monitoring social media. What's your take on monitoring social media from a marketing standpoint as well? Obviously, United Airlines, I would have thought, monitor their social media, but they obviously don't do a whole lot about it. So, I mean, what's your take on that? Yeah. Well, I think you should be monitoring what people are saying about you, about your company, about your products. You should be monitoring. You should be responding as appropriate. But a lot of people get blinders on, and that's all they look at. They only look at their company, their products, the CEO, that, you know, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, what the Eloqua example shows is, is that you should also be paying attention to what's being said about the competition. What the United Breaks Guitars example shows is that you should be aware of what's going on in the general marketplace of where you sell. A, a guitar manufacturer and a guitar case manufacturer took advantage of something that was being talked about right. where United Breaks Guitars. Right. Um, and then the example that I shared of the President of the United States answering my, my Twitter question, what I believe there is that everybody should just be patient to what's going on in the wider world. You know, read a daily newspaper, either online or in print. Read a weekly news magazine, either online or in print. Um, Serendipity is important. You don't always know what's going to happen next. And you certainly can't figure out what the opportunities are if all you do is monitor your company, your products, your name. You have to be thinking wider. I'll give you an interesting example here. So... Um, you may have um, heard in the press that we had this wonderful example of a U.S. congressman with the, the interesting name of Anthony Weiner, who tweeted photographs of his Weiner, <laughs> of his private parts, uh, to young women. I mean, just a crazy story, right? Right. And, I, I, um, I, so even here in the Philippines, I did hear about it, funnily enough. I, 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 it's only a very small it, story from what I understand. Yeah, yeah, right. Exactly. Uh, a left leaning story. Um, so, so, so this was a big, this is a big deal all over the world. And, right. and um, I, I, sh- I was sure you had heard of it. So, um, I mean, imagine what, well, what can you do there? So I love this. The, um, the publisher of Hustler magazine, Larry Flint, porn magazines, essentially, offered Anthony Weiner a job as the head of their internet division. And he offered the job on his blog and said, hey, Anthony Weiner, if you're looking for a new job because you just resigned from Congress, I'd love to have you join me as the vice president of our internet properties. Now, clearly, this was done not, I mean, I'm sure he would have hired Anthony Weiner if he wanted the job, but Weiner wasn't going to take that job. There's no way. But what happened? What happened is that Larry Flint's job offer ended up being the second paragraph of several hundred mainstream media stories, magazines, radio, television, newspapers, because now they're saying, hey, Anthony Weiner just resigned from Congress. That's the first paragraph. The second paragraph is, oh, my gosh, what is he going to do next? Right. And then part of that paragraph is, well, he could go to work for Larry Flint and become a a pornographer because he was just offered a job by Larry Flint. So, and and what a brilliant strategy. I mean, what a brilliant idea to play off of something that's going on in the news and get your company into hundreds of newspaper, magazine, television articles about something happening in the news. You could not have known that had you not had your, um, your, your wider view of the world. You couldn't have done that if you only had this myopic tunnel vision view of your company and your industry. Right, right. And you're absolutely right. And I think, you know, we as a company ourselves do, and I'm so glad to hear it from somebody that I genuinely admire from a marketing standpoint, because I've been in marketing 20 years myself, mostly in relation to branding and telemarketing and you know, that sort of type of thing. So the whole kind of B2B side of things, although I'm Mm -hmm. very confident and I feel I have enough knowledge on that, I still want to learn. I'm always reading and learning and everything. And to hear that come from you as somebody who I do genuinely read uh, and and admire as a marketing quote-unquote expert is great because 
we do monitor our competition just as much as we yeah. monitor ourselves on social media. So I'm yeah, very, absolutely. I'm going to give my, myself a pat on the back here for being so bloody Please fantastic. Do. And that, that's I'll right. give you a virtual, virtual pat on the back. There you go. <laughs> Listen, right. quick question, um, or, or statement rather to finish this up. Um, I understand that you're currently in the process of um, editing a whole batch of books which are coming under this whole kind of banner of new rules of social media, which I think is great. Firstly, how many books do they have slated for this? Um, how many have you done so far? And what's your take on the whole deal? Just to wrap things up here. Yeah, in so way. thanks for that. The, uh, it's called the New Rules of Social Media Book Series. Basically, um, um, I was one of the first people to start writing about these new marketing techniques. And um, a lot of people have said, you know, hey, your new rules of marketing PR is a great book, real, your real-time marketing PR will be raised. I want to get more information on this topic or that topic. For example, I want more information on how to do videos online. I want to have more information on how to measure my success within social media, for example. So I created this series of books. We have other authors who write them. We've done five so far. And um, probably publishing maybe two a year going forward. And it's basically just looking at what is a topic that people want covered in detail. Who's the best author in the world to write on that topic? And then how can we create a great book that will help to provide more information on, on, on how to do a YouTube video or how to measure your marketing success or how to write and create fantastic content for the web. Right, right. So, I mean, you feel that this is something that can, it's got legs? I mean, this thing can, can go on for quite a few years, I would have thought. Yeah, well, we've you know, we sold quite a few copies of the books in the series. Um, some of them are, are the leaders in their, in their category. So, it's interesting. Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, the, the whole social media, new marketing, whatever you want to call it, I call it real-time marketing, is, mm -hmm. um, is, is huge. And people are, are hungry for information. And part of the reason I'm doing this is because it's kind of sticking my stamp of approval on these books, on these authors. So that, um, and there's literally thousands of books on social media out there. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And, and some of them are fantastic. A lot of them aren't. And um, people are looking for information they can trust. Yeah, I mean, I've picked yeah. up several business books in my life that I've read and I've got maybe a third of the way through and thought to myself in my own London colloquialism uh, monologue, this is complete bollocks, why am I wasting yeah, my time yeah. with this, you know, and yeah, I've stopped reading, I stopped reading the book, plain and simple, as, as, should. as, as I you should. should, you're absolutely right, right, so, and then, you know, I'll pick up a David Merman Scott book and uh, you know, start to feel a little bit better with myself. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, David, look, I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed the chat. I reached out to yep. you via a blank email right the way out. We haven't had any uh, major communication, and you responded and said, no problem, let's do it. It would be my pleasure, and I thank you for that. It's been a fantastic chat, and oh, my uh, thank you very, very much for being so accessible and so cool to come on the show so easily. I really appreciate it. Uh, oh, thanks. It works out really well. I'm really glad to be on it. It was fun to, fun to chat. Absolutely so. And next time I'm in Boston, we're having a pint of Guinness on me. Let me okay? know. All right, let me know. All right. Well, to everybody else out there, if you want to find out a little bit more about David, what he does and how he does it so brilliantly, you can visit him at davidmermanscott.com. Follow him on Twitter at DM Scott. And uh, we will see you next time right here on another fantastic edition of the Virtual Business Lifestyle Podcast. Take good care and we'll see you soon. That was another edition of the Virtual Business Lifestyle Podcast. For more information on the lifestyle you'll love to be living, visit www.virtualbusinesslifestyle.com. We'll see you next time.